If you'll recall last year at Thanksgiving, I apologized to you that I would not be preaching a Thanksgiving message because we were in the middle of a series. So I decided to take last year's Thanksgiving message and add it to this year's, so buckle up. You know, when I think about Thanksgiving, I look about in our culture, and it seems that our culture is almost obsessed with wanting more. Like it has this insatiable desire for more and more and more, as if what we have is never enough. And it borders on not being thankful for what we have been given. And Jesus once told a parable about a fella who was looking out for number one, whose primary purpose wasn't just survival. It was about getting everything you'd possibly get to wind up with barn fools, with millions, if you will. More than others, more than God, he was after stuff, just stuff. So I'm going to invite you to turn to Luke 12 this morning if you brought your Bible. If not, it will be on the screen. I want you to know that Jesus knew how difficult it is to keep things in perspective. And it is difficult. Um, That's why nearly half of all the parables that Jesus uh, told, all those stories that had a lesson to them, were uh, just under half of them were um, stories about stuff, possessions, what he called mammon or money, are are material things. Jesus seems to enjoy, as he went through his uh, three years of ministry, he he would give parables in response to people's questions. And he tried to make us focus on what attitudes were when we thought about our stuff, our wallet, our possessions. The story is found in the Gospel of Luke, and it begins with this man in a crowd who interrupts Jesus. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard. Against all kinds of greed, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, hmm, what will I do? I have no place to store all my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Time to take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And Jesus ended this by saying, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. All right, let's take this apart here. What's the problem here? It begins with someone in the crowd saying to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. What is the request here? He wants the inheritance to be divided with him. Was this man saying that Jesus had the authority to tell his brother what to do with the inheritance? Or was it kind of more like a letter to Dear Abby? Have you all seen Dear Abby before? You know, where, you know, my wife, you've read it, my wife always reads your column, so tell her and then, you know, fill in the blank. You know, we don't know. Maybe the older brother had been unfair. Most scholars seem to think that this was a younger brother asking this question, bothered over the fact that it was tradition in Hebrew homes that if there was an older son and a younger son, the older son would receive two-thirds of the inheritance and the younger son one-third. 
If you've ever seen a family fight over an inheritance, you know the pain that can be had, the grief that it brings. Jesus sized up the situation and he decides to use this time as a time of teaching and practical application for all those who were listening because he knew that the problem went much deeper than some tradition. This man's problem was not how he could uh, help him receive a bigger inheritance, but rather it was about how Jesus could help him overcome selfishness, materialism. Jesus answers the man. Let's look at his response. Verses 14 and 15, Jesus said, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And then Jesus said, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That phrase, watch out, happens to be a military term. And uh, it meant to go be on guard duty, to go be alert. Why watch out? He says, because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. There's more to life than stuff, than things. And you know, when I was back in seminary, I got to do a study on this, this Greek word, which is pleonexia. It's the word that's translated greed. And I tried figuring out what it meant, and the best I could come up with was simply this, an insatiable desire for more. You always got to have more. And you might say to yourself, well, what's the big deal? Everybody's greedy. Well, I'm going to give you four reasons this morning, four that I see Jesus clearly outlining here. Why does Jesus say to be on guard, to watch out against greed? Number one, greed makes us captive to envy. You know what envy is, where you always want what other people have. When you see... uh, Jane and Joe drive in in their car, and you go, man, I wish I could have a car like that, right? What's that called? Envy, right? Does anybody remember what the Ten Commandments say about envy? It just says, don't do it, right? I mean, let's keep it simple. How about like when you're fighting to keep your kids under control, and all of a sudden you see Um, Joe and Jane drive in, and their kids all get out, and it's almost like they stand in line, and they're talking very quiet, and you go, man, I wish it, you guys, not, you never ran into this? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, people who want to get rich fall into temptation, into a trap, into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge us into ruin and destruction for the love of money, the love of money, not money itself, but to love it to the root of all evil, all kinds of evil. And some people, it says, eager for money, have wandered from the faith, pierced themselves with much grief. I think we all know people like that who because of their desire for money have to constantly be after the almighty buck and all the big stuff. They don't have time to be a part of kingdom work. They don't have time to be a part of the cause of Christ in any given community. And I think that it would be proper for us to use this Thanksgiving to kind of equate our equilibrium, if you will, to calibrate it. Because you know what? I remember when we were growing up, There was uh, six of us kids at that point, seven total, but at this point that I'm thinking of, there were six of us, and we were always constantly struggling with this issue. You know, things like, he's on my side of the bedroom, you know, because we did not have six bedrooms for the kids and then the master bedroom for mom and dad, you know? And you know what? We all squeeze into the family station wagon He's on my side, or he's on my space. Do you guys remember this? What's the third word a kid learns after mom and dad? Mine. It makes us captive to envy. 
I remember my mom, when she'd tire of all of our bickering, we could, we could hear it in these three words, always wanting more, and you could hear the growl in her voice. And it meant, if you don't shut up, I'm going to wring your neck. <laughs> and you know what? She would have. So it makes us captive to envy. Greed also makes us captive to indebtedness. You know, I've heard counselors say that financial tension causes more divorce than any infidelity. Marriages can survive infidelity much easier than they can survive financial friction. You know, uh, Larry Burkett, uh, big, big time, he was like the Dave Ramsey about 20 years ago. He was a big time Christian um, speaker, pastor, counselor, and he had um, a ministry called Crown Financial Services. And he did a great deal of counseling with people in financial trouble, and he said that 95% of the couples that he counseled who were in financial trouble had a problem with overspending by, who do you think, the husband or the wife? The husband. You're right. And here's why, guys. You know, it's the same reason that every time my wife comes in with a new out outfit, I'm starting to think about that new car that I want to buy. You see, guys buy big toys. And ladies are, just, you know, it's good enough. Just a new outfit is all, thanks. I think that, I don't know. Ten, my tendency is to splurge on big stuff. But I want you to know that spending and hoarding may be different in process, but they are both rooted in greed. That insatiable desire for always wanting more. I just want you to know that the shopping season kicks in at the end of this week, and I'm hearing that it's going to kick in a day earlier, and that now we will have Black Thursday I, I hope that doesn't become the norm because I'll tell you what, are we going to call it that or are we going to call it Thanksgiving? I don't want Thanksgiving shrouded with black anything. But I want you to know this, this shopping season is coming up and the storage business is booming. You know, you can say that we're in a, um, a hard hit economic area but the storage folks around here do not have empty bins and bays. Why? Because we have a penchant for more. And I think that that's why Jesus says very clearly, be, be warned, be on guard, watch out against this thing called greed. Because it can make you captive to envy, it can make you captive to indebtedness, just look at our nation. How many trillion are we in debt? It's not just a, a Conneaut community problem. It's a nationwide problem. And I want you to know the third thing that can happen. Greed can lead to stealing. I'm going to paraphrase this one. But basically, our appetite gets too big for our checkbook. And so because of our insatiable desire for more, we take what we can't buy. I was in a doctor's office recently, and so I discovered this Reader's Digest from January 2000. <laughs> hey, it still has some good stuff in it. I hadn't read it. I probably did read it, and I didn't remember it. But police in Wheeling, Illinois, accused a Walmart cashier of buying merchandise at the store using credit card numbers that she had copied from you, the customer. All right? Investigators admitted in the article that was there that the cashier had made their job quite easy because she identified herself on every single fraudulent receipt so that she could be sure to claim her 10% employee discount. <laughs> Greed can lead to stealing. It also, and here's the most important one, it leads to a loss of eternal perspective. That's the greatest problem. There are some serious consequences mixed in with this, this thing called greed. Listen to Paul's word, Ephesians 5. But among you there must not even be a hint 
of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed. Because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a one is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Those are sobering words. Our disposition and the expression on our faces needs not be tied to the Dow Jones or to how the markets are doing. We cannot allow Satan to suck us into that frame of mind that this nation seems to have fallen prey to, where there's that little piece of magic plastic as if the bill will never come due. It can cause all sorts of problems. Just remember this, fellow married couple, if you are one of those, that financial friction that comes when you get in debt, look at what it's doing to our nation. Imagine what it can do to your household. So this Thanksgiving, what do you wish for? What do you desire? I wish that my priorities communicated a passion for the eternal, for things that are of the kingdom, things that are lasting, rather than the material, temporal things. There's a great theologian named Zwingli who asked this piercing question, do I possess things or do things possess me? I want you to know something. If God has blessed you with a nice home, a nice car, a nice easy chair, or a nice whatever, that's great. But Jesus reminds us to be thankful for what we have been given, for those things even that we have been allowed by his grace to earn. And and he tells an illustration at this point in the story. He tells him what we call a parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, ah, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good stuff, good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Now, let's tear this apart. This man was ambitious, but that was not the problem. Hear me well, saints. God loves ambition. He wants you to be ambitious. Harry Lloyd said, I thank God that I live in a country where dreams can come true, where failure sometimes is the first step to success, and where success is only another form of failure if we forget what our priorities should be. And on the basis of that definition, I I call the man in this parable a successful failure. If you look in your Bibles, it might even say this is the story of the rich fool. Regardless of what we call him, we got to learn not to do what he did, to not follow his example. And that's not easy because we live in a society that is running pell-mell, following lockstep what this guy did. He's living the American dream, temporary success, upward mobility, increased holdings, and ambitious plan. But in the end, it becomes apparent that he's left out that which was most important because he was totally selfish and greedy. That is the problem. Jesus tells the story in such a way that on closer inspection here, we see selfishness more than accomplishment. 
in just two verses. Look at the personal pronoun. This guy is singing the me, me, me song. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns. I mean, you can see this, right? This is all about me, me, me. It's all about him. In fact, the only time he says the word you is in the next phrase, and he's referring to himself. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. This guy is all about himself. Dave Ramsey, um, a student of Larry Burkett's and the author of Financial Peace, writes this. We Americans have identified a concept in the last 30 years, and we all strive for it, of being financially independent. Well, independent of what? Can you gain enough money that you never have to worry or be cautious again? Can you gain enough money that you never have to worry about getting a terrible disease? Like cancer? How much money do you have to make to keep yourself from getting cancer? Think it through. While the man in Jesus' story thought only of himself, he was thinking nothing about eternity. He was in the process of establishing his own personal empire. I heard the uh, illustration about a stockbroker who was granted one wish by the Lord. And he said, well, Lord, um, all I want is one newspaper a week from today. That's what this stockbroker wanted for his wish, a newspaper from next week. And so the Lord granted him his wish, and he had every plan on becoming a multimillionaire because he was going to be able to see what was going down in the market and he was going to score. So the wish granted, he received the paper, he studied the stocks, he planned his strategy, and after several hours of work, decided to take a little break, and he was leafing through the rest of the paper when he suddenly saw his name in the obituaries. Now, if that were you, would that change your strategy? Would that make you change what you have planned to do in the next six days? Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Tillotson said, he who provides for this life but takes no care for eternity is wise for a moment and a fool forever. And Jesus is saying to this man with misplaced priorities, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? So we need a solution. We need to know what is the solution to greed. And I don't want us to misapply this story because it's not saying never build or or don't go bigger. It's, It's not saying anything about having a lack of ambition. I want you to know the whole counsel of the Word of God is clear. From Genesis to Revelation, ambition is characterized as righteous in the eyes of our holy God. Here's just one. It happens to be my favorite from Proverbs. Go to the ant, you sluggard. I just like to say that word. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler yet. It stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. It is one ambitious creature. It is lauded by our God multiple times in Scripture. Jesus is saying ambition is fine. Complacency and selfishness are our enemies. Ambition and proper priorities are to be embraced. This guy wanted to eat, drink, and be merry. He wanted to coast, but he wasn't even prepared for what was going to come that night. And Jesus ends it saying, this is how it'll be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. So, three solutions. First of all, acknowledge that God owns it all. Everything belongs to God, amen? 
We've talked about this numerous times here. It, Dan Hart says, God owns, we manage. We are his stewards. Secondly, practice generosity and be a model to others. And I'm especially talking about our most important disciples, our kids. Are we teaching our kids how to save? I, I mean, you'd think by walking into a bank these days that no one saves anymore. Are we teaching our kids the importance of tithing? I know that as Lacey and Tony were growing up, we had a plastic piggy bank, and it was made up of three buildings. It was all connected, three holes in the top of each of the buildings, and one was a store, one was a bank, and one looked like a church. And so whenever they got money for doing a chore or grandma gave them money because they couldn't help themselves, now I understand that. But whenever that money would come in, we'd have them place it in each of the three. Now, you got to save some. you got to give what belongs to the Lord, and then the rest we'll put in the store, and when we go to the store, we'll help you find good bargains. We showed them how to leverage their buying power, how to make the most of what God was blessing them with. But you want to know something? The first dime of the dollar went to the church. Why? Because God's Word says to do it. And it was important for us to, part, to pass that on to our children. So we acknowledge that everything belongs to God and he gets his first. Practice generosity and be a model to others. You know, this story is told about a fellow who had a weak heart named Stan. And he unexpectedly inherited $2 million, but his wife heard about it first. And she was scared to tell him because he had a weak heart. And she was, she, she was beside herself trying to figure out how to do it until she finally got this idea, I'm going to call my pastor. And she called her pastor and she goes, Pastor, we inherited $2 million and I don't know how to tell Stan. Would you please come over and tell him for me? And so the pastor came over and he'd come up with his game plan and he's pulled his chair up next to Stan and he said, Stan, um, let me ask you a hypothetical question. Let's say that, you know, suppose you inherited, well, I don't know, $2 million. Well, what would you do with it? Well, Stan didn't miss a lick, didn't even take a breath. He said, well, the first thing I'd do is give a million to the church. And the preacher fell out of the chair, keeled over of a heart attack. <laughs> Here's the deal. We need to live with eternity in mind. Don't get caught up in trying to keep up with the Joneses. Live in moderation. Because the tendency of this culture is to buy stuff we don't even need with money that we don't have to impress people we don't even like. I don't get it. The core of the problem with this rich man in the parable was that it was all about him. Me, 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 me. It was his plans for establishing his empire. His focus was on accumulating more and more for himself rather than having any focus towards God. That's why Jesus ended this story by saying, this is how it'll be with anyone who stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. And life is too short. I was taught this at a pretty young age. My dad made it to 51 and then he went home. And I want you to know I felt robbed, but I sure learned this. I don't have tomorrow. We are one breath away from being with our Lord, amen? We've gotta live like it. We think if we have more things that it'll fill a void, and I want you to know that void is made up of a vacuum. And it doesn't matter how much stuff you throw into your storehouses, how much stuff you bring into your life. It, nothing can fill that hole but Christ. The Romans used to have a saying, money is like seawater. The more a man drinks of it, the thirstier he becomes. Think that through. Mother Teresa said, if it takes more than 15 minutes to pack your belongings, you've got too much stuff. I'm glad she never came to my house. 
I remember when this fella came um, from Africa and visited um, our home down in Maslin, Ohio, my mom and dad's home. And he was incredulous. I remember this as a kid because it struck me as funny. He was incredulous over the fact, he said, even your cars have houses. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? The garage. He could not believe that we had a house for our cars. I don't know if we understand how fortunate we are, how blessed we have been, how affluent our country is, even 16 trillion in debt. We're still a rich country. And Matthew 6 should, should be in our minds. Do not store up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves will break in and steal, but store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I want to close today with this story. David Livingston, you may have heard of him, man who gave all that he had to serve Christ. He very easily could have spent hours in a plush, luxurious office. He was well-educated, but instead, he chose to go over to Africa as God's missionary. And he served there on the mission field. I want you to know that for many years, Livingston was the only white man in that particular area of Africa. And he shared his beliefs with the natives. He introduced them to Jesus. Channeled all of his energies into that one single purpose, to spread the good news of Christ to people who'd never heard his name. And after a number of years of service, Livingston got sick. He contracted a disease there in Africa, which eventually took his life. The natives were crushed. They dearly loved this man who had introduced them to Jesus. In fact, they loved him so much that before his body was shipped back to England, the natives honored Livingston by removing his heart and burying it there in the African soil. They felt that after all of his years of sacrifice, all of his service, that his heart belonged there. Let's bow. I just want to ask you, where would your heart be buried? Would it be at the office? Maybe at the mall? Underneath the TV set? At the bank? Where would your heart be buried? Because Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where, what is your treasure? Wherever it is, be assured of this, your heart will not be far away. And so, Lord, this day we cry out as your people with thanksgiving. Help us to dwell upon you, upon your mission. Help us to keep an eternal perspective. Lord, we don't want to dwell on what we have or don't have. We just thank God for what you've blessed us with. We thank you for the ambition that you have also allowed us to have. But Lord, at the end of the day, we wanna honestly say thank you with gratitude from our hearts for what we have. We wanna be content with what we have even as our ambition drives us for more. We wanna have an eternal perspective. And so this Thanksgiving, Lord, rather than dwelling on what we can accumulate, we just wanna focus on your son, on our savior, on the mission that he's invited us to here at New Leaf and in this beautiful place called Kaniat. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.